Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the next um, episode of the Business Performance Podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to talk with Messer, who is the CEO and founder of FitFinder and also a new venture with UChip. And he's had quite an interesting experience over the past several years, and I'm very proud to be able to interview him today. So, Messer, to begin with, would you please briefly describe your company, FitFinder, the type of customers you cater to, and the types of services that you provide? All right. Well, to begin with, I'm very, very, very thankful and grateful for having me over at your podcast. Um, in a nutshell, FitFinder is a marketplace for fitness activities and services. Every single thing that we do uh, on a daily basis revolves around our understanding and, and our undoubted belief that the average individual deserves an instant, more comprehensive, personalized access to fitness activities and services in order for, that, for us to change their behavior and allow them to um, adapt a healthier, uh, active lifestyle, this is what we should do. We should provide them with a platform that removes the barriers, reduces the noise, um, personalize their experience, um, but most importantly, create a perfect unrambling tool toward a healthy, more active lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We built FitFinder. FitFinder uh, is the only platform that, with a single click, allows you to have an access to anything from passes, classes, meetups, events, trails, tracks, uh, fitness sessions with fitness professionals. We are consolidating the entire platform for the first time ever in a single app, and we are making it, as I said, as simple as a single click. So you, uh, does that like integrate the um, Fitbit and Garmin trackers and everything as well? That's a, our uh, kind of next iterations. We are laser focused on building one thing at the time. So our first thing that we will build is a big uh, marketplace where we connect with partners uh, within the industry. We get data from them. Uh, in terms of fitness activities and services provided to the consumer. And then after that, we get connected with their data in terms of Fitbits and, and trackers and pedometers and all those other platforms, and then tailor their experience as, as we progress. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. It also makes me think about um, RPCs and you know, artificial intelligence. So are you factoring that into because of the amount of volume of data that you've got to integrate and study? Yes, um, this is, <laughs> the, you're, you're uh, very interesting, very good uh, uh, observation because very few people that understand that aspect of the industry, the amount of data, the amount of inferences that can be extrapolated from such a platform, it's so powerful, it can get connected to other major industries like healthcare, like uh, mid-care, like uh, corporate wellness, uh, name it. Mm -hmm. so, um, this is absolutely our big kind of uh, lay, um, uh, but you can't really go full force on it from the first day, you just have to go one step at a time. So I just want to let you know, there will be some periodic interruptions. We're having some furniture delivered and assembled today. So when you see okay. zipping by and photo bombing, that's what's happening. No, it's okay. I got it. I love it. Yeah, we're going to try to edit that out as well. So um, given where you are right now, what, what do you see as the importance of quality of what you're doing to your customer base? It's of a high importance. Um, one, um, in terms of quality for, uh, uh, for the consumer, uh, there are several aspects of it. One is the user interface. Uh, the, the, the user interface, I'm not talking about how bright the color should be or how 
uh, I'm talking about the quality as in uh, their, their user experience in general. Um, uh, is it something that really drives them uh, to use the app? Is it uh, a, a certain, uh, uh, did we um, utilize or um, did we manage to attention or engineer the attention uh, so they can have a higher lifetime value? Do we uh, connect them to the right service providers that provide the services that cater toward their needs, their interests, their, um, uh, their fitness level, and their, even their physical status? Um, mm -hmm. Those, this is one aspect. The quality of, from the other side of the market, do we connect the right consumer to the right service provider? Do we, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, provide them with the proper business tools that can empower their businesses uh, to uh, achieve their financial goals. There are so many aspects for it that I can touch on, on that, but um, uh, those are the top that comes to my mind as well. Okay. All right, so what do, so by doing your research and coming up with this application, what are one or two of the biggest myths or misconceptions about what you're trying to do from a business performance perspective or deliver to your customer base? Um, the misconception is one thing that I actually fill in. Uh, one is uh, that the fitness industry has a problem. The problem is actually not in the fitness industry. The problem is in the consumer facing tech platforms. Mm -hmm. Having the fitness industry. Those platforms, like many, without mentioning the names, have caused fragmented accessibility, uh, overwhelm. Uh, so I will give you an example, a very good example for those two uh, problems. Fragmented accessibility. If you want a fitness class, you go to download this app. If you want a uh, a meetup, you go to meet. If you want an event, you go to event. Mm -hmm. if to uh, to find your trainer, you will download find tra your trainer. You know, one of the many fitness apps out there. So this, in terms of the fragmented accessibility, the overwhelm is very simple. Let's do it. Let's do this. You know, case scenario together. If you write now, write a find fitness classes near me on Google, you'll find 300 million search plus results. Mm -hmm. That is not helping the end consumer at all. So um, there's three other major problems, which is uh, third was uh, the, the, the inconvenience uh, of the solutions, the uh, loss of time, money, energy, effort, due to the fact that the process gets longer and uh, exhausting. And the third, but the, the fifth one is something that I didn't actually know. There's a huge part of the population, whether they are underrepresented or minority or you know, underserved communities, they lack a true um, platform, a platform that provide them a, a truly democratized access mm -hmm. to activities and services because it has been promoted as a fancy lifestyle kind mm -hmm. of you know, activity. So that was, uh, that was my very first initial understanding that I thought that the fitness industry is not doing everything right. That was the first. Second thing was, um, that it was way bigger than me. Um, it's not way bigger than me, I just needed to learn more about myself and my own case. Okay. That's All right. Okay, wonderful. So what do you see as your big, number one biggest challenge today? My biggest challenge today? Um, there is something that is going on in the, um, investment uh, world at the moment. Um, there's a lot of investors are focused on uh, 
the opposite of every single thing I said at the beginning. Somebody who is a, not a minority, not a, a immigrant, basically <laughs> a privileged person, whatever the color it is, I don't care, but um, um, uh, somebody who's been there, done that, so they want to find somebody who have already successful exit. Um, and uh, there is, and, and, and that fact is actually causing, causing the entrepreneur landscape to, if that's the right word, uh, drought. And it's, it's a cause for a lot of entrepreneurs die way too early in, uh, in their uh, um, you know, timeline before they even start some of it. So the challenge is not having enough investors that are willing to actually go after early stage founders who are, um, who are showing promise or even not showing promise. The thing that they need to understand is great ideas, a, a, a yes, is very cheap. Uh, the hardest part is the execution. Mm -hmm. But if I can provide you with 60 to 70% of that, then later on, it's okay. You can replace that CEO and put another person who was, he, whose job is only to drive that forward. Mm -hmm. You know, we are not perfect for everything, you know, so somebody could be a visionary or, or, or somebody that can lead a company towards a different you know, direction. Somebody who is not mean to be a leader, you know, sometimes visionaries are not leaders. You know? uh, so with that being said, I think we need more investors that understand entrepreneurship way deeper than just, hey, you've got something good, I think I can make money, let me put some money with you. Yeah. I completely understand that this is, this is your point in life, that you want to double your money, but at least have the courage to, you know what, let me put a little bit with you and see where you can go. Mm -hmm. Diversify in a way that will empower other individuals in the community to actually blossom, you know? Uh, and that's, that's about it. Okay. My so, channel. So have you um, read or uh, the Lean Startup by Eric Ries? Have you looked at that? Yes, yes. It's one of my favorite books, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm working my way through that. Um, it's, it's, for me, from my perspective, there's nothing new there. It's just the way it's being, um, applied in the startup. We still have to do all this stuff, but it's, it's scaling it down to where it makes sense. And doing lots of experiments and, you know, failing fast, see what it works, test your hypotheses, and then refine, pivot, and move on. Um, see, the thing is, not every entrepreneur will be able to understand all those things at once. Uh, some of the, some of even the CEOs at the very, very top of level of major organization, they still go to, to uh, courses and they take classes and certain things. And nowadays, the bar became way too high that they are forgetting that this is not entrepreneurship anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, for example, I will give you a very small example on the accelerator landscape right now in Austin. There used to be a lot of accelerator programs that takes zero equity or take a little bit of equity, but they give you money at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. oh, this number has dropped down almost to maybe two or three percent. Ah. The, the, the landscape right now is you have to have a rec monthly recurring revenue. Okay. It's again, I understand your point, you know, you have to vet the, the money, where is it going and all that. But you're killing the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I went and talked with the Texas Angel Network a couple of years ago to, to see how that worked. And they would put people through a program and, and use that to whittle it down to pick two or three out of the program that they want to invest in. 
yep. it was a very rigorous type of thing, and they were really restricting who they would reach even get into the program. Yeah, they are very, very strict. Uh, I mean, they are alone. Um, it's, it's, it's getting really bad. And one like myself actually can feel that because I have more obstacles in front of me, um, as I said, from being a first-time founder or, 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 or a minority or whatever, so many. Uh, but who's out there to say, hey, come over here. Um, you've been doing all this and, and you still build a company, you managed to get a CEO, a Fortune 500 CEO, you've managed to build a team, then you, you lost because of something, and then you learned, you built another team, you're still driving, and you came over here with two grants? Oh my God, like, hold on, what's your story? Let's, let's sit down and analyze your brain, and you know, if your idea is good, then you're 100% can execute, because you have proven it, more than once. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue into it. So could you kind of, you know, just tell us about your personal story from when you arrived here in the U.S. and to where you are today. Um, I landed over here with uh, my beautiful wife. It's a typical story of, uh, of uh, <laughs> a foreigner fell in love with a white uh, American girl. Uh, but um, uh, I met her in Dubai. Um, Four years ago and then we were supposed to go to Australia and that was my dream basically she was like America is much better for you for your uh, for your uh, for your concept came over here landed in Houston um, we researched first what kind of uh, cities will be good to uh, launch my project in and uh, we thought that a big city like Houston would be good um, Everything in life happens for a reason. If I did not go to Houston, I would have not made my contact. And um, but anyway, uh, we built the project. The, the 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 design phase took a little bit too long because I was a little bit uh, uh, more focused on uh, engineering the attention, as I said, and focus on uh, on on changing the behavior of the individual. Um, so, um, we managed to move over here to Austin around, uh, I think a year and two months ago. And this is when we started launching around 10 months ago and the market, we had an amazing response from the market. Uh, we've made few mistakes, mistakes here and there. Uh, but I love mistakes. I live for mistakes. It's, it's awesome. Now that I go for them on purpose. Um, but then right now we are at um, a, a little, we are raising our first seed funding round. It's a little bit challenging, but um, that's the name of the game in life in general. Um, and we are showing no sign to stop. Okay, wonderful. So um, uh, let's see now. So uh, when I I guess, you know, what types of mistakes so you said, you know, that mean you, that's what you learn from mistakes. So what types of mistakes or can you share with us that you've made <coughs> that helped you move forward? Hmm. <coughs> um, first of all, um, one, <coughs> if you're going to be an entrepreneur, don't be an entrepreneur before learning more about yourself. And um, the only way to learn more about yourself is drop every single uh, pre-learned um, anything and just open yourself to the world and become more self-aware. If you become more self-aware, you will realize and understand more about your own self, your skills, your, uh, your, your, your understanding to the world, your, your needs, your, um, uh, your advantages, disadvantages, weaknesses, and so forth. Once you highlight uh, those things, you'll be able to move forward faster. 
because you become leaner in your thinking. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, oh, I don't have a marketing individual. Oh, it's okay, I can, I can do a little bit of marketing. Wrong. You are going to take out of your time and you're gonna spread yourself too thin trying to make every single thing work and this is not right. Yeah. So self-awareness is a key element to your ability to move toward the right direction leaner and faster. Okay. Second, right. So if, you, yeah. if somebody was to come to you and say, how can I become more self-aware? <laughs> What would you suggest that they would do? Nobody under nobody have a um, uh, nobody have a magic potion for that. Mm -hmm. I think I think it becomes it, it it comes to you through your own desire of becoming a better person. Mm -hmm. So would you? Would it be fair to say being humble and listening to others and saying, okay, there, here, though, when I make a mistake, I can get better at this? Well, what does it make difference if you're going to become humble but not take advices? Mm -hmm. what, what, how is it going to make difference if you take advices but not apply it? Mm -hmm. yeah. What does it make of a difference if you apply it but you don't, you're not able to extrapolate lessons? It's a, a big mix of a lot of things. And they start from, hey, let me be self-aware so I understand the world around me. And once I understand, I want to interact with it in that way. Yeah, yeah that, that reminds me of reading Eric Reese's book is that you know, he, he started out with his one failed enterprise where he thought he had the perfect solution and wasn't listening to everybody and built all this great technology, but then it was like, nobody wanted it. <laughs> and so that was a very humbling experience. It opened his eyes. Absolutely. I, I've, I've listened to that book, and the first part was, the first part of the book, I think the first two chapters, it shows you, no matter what you think, the market controls everything. Right. And in that sense, the market is equal the consumer so if you're not aware to listen and learn fuel your project with the feedback iterate get out test get results and then fuel back and then it's a circle then you can't win mm -hmm. So, could you spend a, a moment just telling our listeners a little bit about your backstory and your history, you know, from childhood on? What was your one defining moment to, to inspire you to become an entrepreneur? Uh, uh, at a 14 years old, I had a small note uh, where my dad. Uh, my dad walked in on, on me on, on my uh, bedroom and he noticed that I hid something really quickly under the pillow and he was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, nothing. And then <laughs> the pillow and he was like, what are you writing? I said, nothing. It's just like some ideas in my head. And he goes like, he started reading it out and I basically was saying ideas that I can have when I that I can apply when I have my own IT computer company. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so seven years later, I was practically the youngest person that he ever knew to, have, to own the third largest company in our city. Wow, very good. So your father, then he saw it and was very supportive of what you wrote then. No. He, he, he laughed his ass off and he made mockery of me. He kept repeating it over and over, over the next maybe month or something, that it became an obsession for me that I will prove him, like, I'll, I'll, you're laughing at me? I, I will show you. <laughs> so that was, that was your defining moment was to say, take, oh, that was, yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> I can make this work. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think I'm, uh, 
again, that's a little bit of, 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 of uh, self-awareness because you, you understand that you're a competitive individual and then this is where you need to go. All right, so given now that your Fit Finder has been around for a couple of years and you're working on getting more funding, what does success look like for you then? What would you, what would you say uh, that demonstrates you've been successful with this? <clears throat> Um, Fit Finder um, has been, Fit Finder was launched around eight months ago, effectively with a minimum viable product. Um, uh, success for me is when our target consumers becomes a um, when Fit Finder, when the Fit Finder app becomes a daily use for our target consumer, and um, it's not because we are, we are not a social media platform. We're not a, uh, a search engine. We're not a, 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 a sort of marketplace. We're trying to change your behavior in understanding that the fitness industry, for the first time, is at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. And for or, in order for us to do that, we have to do so many things to be able to please so many um, or, or, or wide range of tastes. Uh, surprisingly, because I'm a fitness professional, I've done marketing, I've done business development, I'm a neurolinguistic programming practitioner. I was on both sides of the market. Um, I understood every single part of this game so deep that I actually find it very simple. It takes time, but it's very simple. So the short answer is when we really manage to help the average individual understand that they have the entire industry at their fingertip and they can go to it whenever they want without having any fear or anxiety or, or um, any um, kind of negative feeling around the app. They just feel that this is their one destination or their savior kind of app. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so what types of measurable outcomes have you seen now since it's gone live? You like what's your install base? What's the, what's the growth look like, et cetera? Um, in the first three and a half months, sorry, two and a half months. So here is the, the beautiful thing. The power of the thousand true fans. Uh, in the first three months, we were talking 50 users per month, so a total of 150 users, and um, that basically turned into 3,500 dollars. Okay. Um, so the percentage was just basically beyond the charts. Uh, and on the other side of the market, we were targeting 10 service providers, and it was an organic growth of almost 18% of the entire service providers in, the, in Austin area signed up to our plan. Um, so uh, we were not as much focused on this as much as we were focused on the actionable metrics. And you'll probably uh, hear more about it in the Lean Startup. Um, so actionable metrics, how did we came here, why? And what is that makes our users feel? So in a sense, we were focused on the lifetime value of the user. The why do, you, do they find the app as their best content? And, and, and so many other questions that allowed us to understand that there are three main personas that appeals to our app beyond any other person. And when we started targeting those more, uh, through our word of mouth, it became way, way better uh, adoption. Wow. So how, how do you get that information? What are you doing to pull that, that type of information out of the minds of your projected um, consumer base? 
So uh, I'm, I'm personally, I was active in the fitness uh, industry. I am still uh, yet right now. I'm just trying to focus a little bit on the funding part. Uh, but um, I would go to meetups uh, and I will act like I'm basically, I just came over here through this ad. And then um, the meetup organizer will be like, oh, that's a, how, how did I not hear about that? I'm like, yeah, a friend of mine just told me about it. What do you think about it? That's, that's, a, that's a crazy thing. Maybe I'm trying to get the industry in one platform. This is it's not achievable. I will basically say something that they don't want to, they, that I don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. I would see the response from the other side. They basically write in front of me. They will be like, hey, sending messages to the and sharing the actual uh, link to the app. Mm -hmm. That was um, that was one of the like kind of field study, uh, but then we got uh, we got contacted by many of the organizations. We got contacted by uh, fitness service providers, um, like we want to create a better partnership and a stronger collaboration. Um, we got contacted by. Retailers, mm. sports brands, who wants to create a their events in collaboration with us or co-sponsored events and so forth. So we we were focused on those kind of relationships because if I get approached by those kind of people while I'm still at that stage, then it is very meaningful for that. Mm -hmm. I'm providing them with a compelling value. Okay, so that kind of leads into my next question. So as you, um, you're talking to people, what's the most important question that your customers should be asking about what you are delivering as a service? Hmm. What should my customers ask in terms of what do I deliver as a service? I guess, when is the next release? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think within a matter of uh, two months or something, we will have a uh, our alpha release. It's gonna be, uh, is going to be an amazing experience for the user. Um, we have an overall rating of 4.85 uh, on both of the marketplaces, so that's a quite good enough user experience. But I'm one of those people that very um, not skeptical, but I like to see more. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe those people gave us those reviews because they were in our network. Although I don't know. Um, ninety-five percent of those individuals, and I'm very thankful for the reviews. Um, but I would say uh, the next phase is going to be is going to involve uh, personalization. It's going to involve rewards. It's going to involve functions that does not even exist in major companies that worth more than five hundred millions uh, of. Uh, of uh, valuation at the moment, mm -hmm. which is shocking for me. Yeah. Uh, so, so is your install base just here in Austin right now, or are you looking to yes, Russia? Absolutely, only in Austin. So, uh, you can imagine what we are able to do with uh, with a little bit of capital and a little bit of growth all over uh, nationwide. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah, just a couple more of the lessons learned. If you, you know, given where you are now, you're several months into this and you've been down the path several times. If you had to start all over again from scratch with FitFinder, what would you keep, what behaviors would you keep and what would you change? In the app or in the journey in general? Just, just in the journey the, from the company perspective. Hmm. Um, From a company perspective, again, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. 
find a mentor, mm -hmm. somebody that is aligned 100% with your vision, mission, journey, where you're from, um, your values, um, just something out there for people to understand that the world is not small. My COO, uh, uh, Brad Beckman, he's the reason behind my growth. He's Christian. Um, I took him to the masjid, and he was almost close to taking me to the church, just celebrating each other's background. Uh, unfortunately, he left before that. So um, um, find your mentor, like basically feed off each other's energy. Mm -hmm. uh, Find your truth, thousand, uh, the, your thousand true fans. Those are the core of who you, you will be. Um, please them. If you manage to please them, then they will turn into a walking, talking billboard. If you manage to do so, then you are off to a good, I wouldn't say good, a great start. Okay. Um, Wonderful. So, how if somebody wants to talk to you and learn more from you about what you've done, how can they get in touch with you? Um, my email is on LinkedIn. Um, you can DM me. You can uh, find me on social media on, on Instagram account, uh, Messer Sala. Uh, my LinkedIn, uh, Messer ASA, and um, I'm very reachable in terms of like if there is any startup founder that needs a little bit of help with uh, with anything i've actually built a step-by-step -step guide for startup founders in terms of every single part of the business um so anywhere from before you start to starting phase to you know uh, product roadmap and, and, and product development, to marketing, to uh, business development and, and funding, every single thing that I'm learning at the moment or I have learned for the last four years, I have put it in a very um, you know, ordered manner and um, basically I can, like if somebody comes to me and says, okay, I'm at this phase, I'm at this, uh, you know, uh, re, uh, reseed, no monetization whatsoever. I'm still uh, not able to do so and so. And then I go into that specific module and we walk forward. You know, so anybody to help uh, to, to um, even help with that or any help with this part, uh, I'll be more than happy to do so. Wonderful. Well, Mister, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed your stories immensely. I just always like to hear these types of stories of people with are being successful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.